Good morning. I'm Nelson Friedman, ALAA Corporate Secretary and Administrator of Educational Programs. Welcome to the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics Short Course Hypersonic Aerodynamics Basic and Applied, broadcast live via satellite to several hundred participants across the United States. We also have here this morning in this well-equipped studio at the University of Maryland, the College Park campus, a live audience of about 25 students. We'd like you to please be certain to fulfill your course evaluation forms as the program progresses today and tomorrow. And for those of you who are at remote sites, we'd like you to mail the evaluation form to us by the end of this week, and we'll be happy to send you this certificate of completion suitable for framing. We're indeed fortunate to have as instructors three experts with practical and theoretical research experience in the propulsion and aerodynamic aspects of hypersonic flight vehicles. They are Dr. John D. Anderson, Jr., Dr. Mark J. Lewis, and Dr. Kevin G. Bocut. Dr. Anderson is professor of aerospace engineering here at the University of Maryland, where he has been named Distinguished Teacher Scholar. Dr. Anderson has published six books and over 100 papers during his career. In fact, the text for this course is Dr. Anderson's very popular hypersonic and high temperature gas dynamics, published by McGraw-Hill. Dr. Bocut is a member of the technical staff at Rockwell's North American Aviation Division. He's currently responsible for leading the nozzle design, analysis, and technology development team activities of the National Air Space Plane. Dr. Lewis's research interests at the University of Maryland incorporate problems in propulsion diagnostic techniques, including flow visualization and image enhancement. Viscous and unsteady hypersonic flows, particularly as they relate to engine design, and innovative space propulsion concepts. It is my very great pleasure to introduce at this time the course leader, Dr. John D. Anderson, Jr. Thank you, Nelson, and I want to welcome everybody both here at the University of Maryland as well as uh, out there at the remote sites to this course uh, on hypersonic aerodynamics, the basics uh, with applications. Uh, I have just a few kind of administrative things to say before we get going, in, in a sense. The, you'll notice that this is a two-day course. The first day today is just going to be a discussion of the basic aspects of uh, hypersonic aerodynamics. The, what we're going to hear today, in essence, is, the, is a synthesis of a, what, a, what is usually a three-day course, all wrapped up into about five hours today. Uh, for those of you who are interested in a more extensive discussion of the fundamental aspects of uh, hypersonic aerodynamics, the AIAA have presented, uh, sponsored a course uh, a few year, about a year and a half ago, and has a tape available for, for that, uh, for viewing. So what we're in for today will be just a very, a very concentrated review of some of the basic fundamentals of hypersonic aerodynamics. That will feed into the discussions tomorrow carried out by my colleagues, uh, beginning with Dr. Mark Lewis in the morning and Dr. Kevin Bocott in the afternoon, uh, discussing some various aspects of applications of hypersonic aerodynamics and propulsion. Now, the, I have a, have a couple of questions for you, first of all. Are you a person who, who knows nothing about hypersonic aerodynamics? You've never worked in the area, you've never studied in the area, you've hardly thought much about the area. You know nothing about hypersonic aerodynamics. Is this a course for you? And the answer is yes. Because one of the objectives that we want to accomplish with this course is to start with people more or less at ground zero and build you up in the space of two days to the point where you feel comfortable with some of the basic ideas and applications in hypersonic flow. Are you uh, on the other extreme? Are you an expert in hypersonic aerodynamics? Have you been working in the field for a number of years? Do you know or think you know everything that's going on? Uh, should you be viewing this course? And the answer is yes. Because in the course of our discussion between the three presenters, 
I would like to think that we will present thoughts and ideas maybe in a different way and in different words and from different angles than maybe you've looked at things in the past. So from that point of view, I hope that this course will be beneficial to you. The objective of the course, my objective is this. When you walk out of wherever this room or wherever you are tomorrow afternoon at 5 o'clock, our objective is to have you in a better position to understand the literature in hypersonic aerodynamics and propulsion, to better talk with your colleagues. You run down the hall and talk to your local expert in hypersonic flow. You can better understand what he or she is talking about. And most important of all, that you just simply feel more comfortable with the whole idea of hypersonic flow. That's our objective. So please keep that in mind, uh, and hopefully each and every one of you will kind of feel that when you walk out at uh, 5 o'clock tomorrow afternoon. Okay, that's a little bit of introduction. That's kind of where we're going and what we're after. Uh, I have uh, a, some other introductory remarks having to do with the general concepts, so general, the whole philosophy of hypersonic aerodynamics. And we're going to go to some slides to show this. So we will stage right for a moment here. John, if we could have the lights down, thank you. The, what I have, what you see on the screen there is a hypersonic wind tunnel configuration. I want you to consider this as mood music, as backdrop for a couple of comments. I'd like for you to pretend, I want you to transport yourself back into time. I'd like you to pretend that, go, that you're going back to the late 1950s, the 1960s. You're in the world of aerodynamics and you look around this world of aerodynamics and what do you see, especially in the area of basic research in aerodynamics? Well, what you see is a tremendous emphasis on high-speed flight. You see, uh, for example, uh, you see vehicles like intercontinental ballistic missiles uh, that are coming online. You see the beginnings of the manned space program, which represents uh, first the like beginning with the Mercury program and ultimately uh, kind of accumulating uh, in, in terms of the Apollo program uh, in the late 1960s. And again, when you look around, you, you see all kinds of activity in hypersonic aerodynamics. You see industry, government, and uh, university laboratories building hypersonic wind tunnels, uh, rather, also rather sophisticated shock tunnels and shock tubes. Uh, for hypersonic testing, you see a lot of uh, theoretical work going on in hypersonics, tremendous amount of effort. And in fact, in that period of time, in the basic research area, if you look around for low-speed aerodynamics, subsonic flow, transonic flow, even supersonics, you can hardly find it. It's mainly on the shelf. Now, let's transport ourselves. This is more mood music, by the way. Let's tra transport ourselves to the 1970s. And you look around at the world of aerodynamics again. And what do you see? Well, one thing you don't see is activity in hypersonic aerodynamics. The ap vehicle applications have more or less been accomplished, and basic research, basic effort in hypersonic aerodynamics has gone to essentially zero. A lot of those wind tunnels and shock tubes and shock tunnels that were built in the 50s and 60s are now being cut up for scrap in the 1970s. Virtually, in, in, this, in this period of time, hypersonic aerodynamics, it's on the shelf, and there's a renewed inference, properly so, in subsonic, transonic, and supersonic foam. So here we are, here's in April 1991, and we're talking, we're in a course here dealing with hypersonic aerodynamics. Well, what's happened? Well, the natural thing has happened. New vehicle concepts has come on, have come online. Uh, I'm just showing this slide to indicate to you what some of those concepts are. Uh, the, there's renewed interest, of course, in, in hypersonic, airplane, hypersonic transports, transatmospheric vehicles, of which the National Airspace Plane is kind of an example of that. Aero sister, we'll just say orbital transfer vehicles. Uh, uh, all of these vehicles, without going into the details, are hypersonic vehicles which have rejuvenated and, and, and enhanced a great deal of new interest in hypersonic aerodynamics. And so that's why we're in this room today, talking about the field of hypersonic flow. And I presume that's why all of you are here uh, with some inquiries, with some interest in the field. Okay, now, now that we've kind of justified what we're doing here, uh, have a question. So we have hypersonic aerodynamics. You know, so what? What's so special about hypersonic aerodynamics? Yeah, what's, 
What's so different uh, about, say, flight at Mach 25 compared to flight at Mach 2? You know, isn't hypersonic aerodynamics just simply the uh, supersonic flow where you just keep on going to higher Mach numbers? You know, what, what's so special about hypersonic aerodynamics, or is there anything special about it? Well, let's take a look for a minute. What you're looking at here this photograph of the Bell X-1 hanging uh, with distinction at the National Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C. You're looking at an airplane that was the first airplane to break the speed of sound. And you're looking at an airplane that embodies uh, reasonable, uh, reasonably good supersonic aerodynamics. If you look at the nose of that vehicle, it's sharp. You look at the wings, the wings are fairly thin, about 9% thickness. Leading edge fairly sharp, slender body. Sharp nose, thin wings, slender body. That's good supersonic aerodynamics. By the way, does anybody know why? Why is that good supersonic aerodynamics? Can anybody tell me? We are reducing the strength of the shock waves and hence trying to reduce the drag associated with the shock waves on that airplane. In other words, every effort is being made in that design to reduce supersonic wave drag. Okay? Now, Here's the F-104, also uh, in this, uh, this picture hanging at the National Air and Space Museum. This is the first uh, combat aircraft designed for sustained flight at Mach 2, and it really beautifully embodies great supersonic aerodynamics. Look at that sharp nose. The wings are so thin, the wings have four, are essentially 4% thickness. The leading edge on the wings are so, is, are so sharp that they pose uh, uh, basically a, a, a danger to maintenance personnel working around the airplane. Slender body, sharp nose, thin wings, sharp leading edge. Excellent supersonic aerodynamics. Okay, now, you want to design an airplane not to fly at Mach 2, but you want to design an airplane that's going to fly at Mach 5 or Mach 10 or Mach 15. What are you going to do? Well, aren't you going to just extrapolate this concept further? Aren't we going to essentially end up with a needle, a flying needle, the ultimate in a slender body for hypersonic flow? Is that, uh, that's what this would tell us to extrapolate out. Well, let's take a look. Here's the X-15, designed for maximum Mach 7 flight. Well, if you look carefully at that, that's not quite, you know, the, the nose isn't that much, in fact, it's less sharp. In fact, there's a little bluntness on that nose. If you would look carefully at the wings, the wings are fair, aren't so thin anymore. Uh, and they're rounded leading edges. The leading edges aren't, isn't, they're not so sharp anymore. Let's continue on. Uh, here's a a uh, diagram of the X-20 dinosaur, which was essentially never flown, certainly major design activity, and that's, a, that's designed for about Mach 20. And look what we have here. We're getting blunter noses. We're getting blunter leading edges. The, uh, we're, we're going in the opposite direction of what you might think. Here's the ultimate uh, space shuttle, uh, Mach 25 airplane, so to speak. And that certainly is not an extrapolation of the X-1 and the F-104 by any means, but yet that's a hypersonic vehicle. So conclusion, there's got to be some difference between hypersonic aerodynamics and supersonic aerodynamics, because if there weren't, then these vehicles wouldn't look so different. Hypersonic vehicles look different than su supersonic vehicles. And the reason is, is that there is, there are some differences between hypersonic aerodynamics and supersonic aerodynamics. And again, that's why we're having a two-day discussion on the special characteristics of hypersonic flow. Now, before we go any further, uh, John, if I could ask you to bring the lights back up for a minute. Uh, I'm gonna ask a second question. Since we've established that hypersonic flow is obviously interesting, it's got some differences uh, compared to supersonic flow and so forth, what we ought to do is say, well, what are those differences? And in fact, let's just simply define hypersonic flow. If I asked you to pull out a piece of paper and write down for me, pop quiz, and write down for me definition of hypersonic flow, what would one most likely do? Well, or if I just ask you a homework problem, go home tonight, write down for me a definition of hypersonic flow. Where would you look? Well, you'd probably open up some conventional high, you know, compressible flow textbook, and you look in the index under hypersonic flow, I'll see that on page 150, and you read. There it is, hypersonic flow. A flow where the Mach number is greater than five. 
Now, that's what you'll see in most, def you know, in most locations is a definition of hypersonic flow, flow where the Mach number is five. Now, think about that for a minute. If this pen were flying along or cruising along at Mach 4.99 and we accelerated just a little bit to Mach 5.01, there's not going to be any crash of thunder. The flow is not going to change from green to red. Nothing is going to happen when you fly through Mach 5. When you define hypersonic flow as a flow where the Mach number is greater than 5, that is just a rule of thumb definition. And this is quite different than when you fly through, through Mach 1, because when you fly from Mach 0.99 to Mach 1.01, there is a crash of thunder, and indeed the flow, the physics of the flow does change from green to red, if you wish. But not so when you go through Mach 5. And so, what is hypersonic aerodynamics? Hypersonic aerodynamics is, is really a lot more than just thinking about flying faster than Mach 5. So we're going to go back to the slides here for a minute. And we're going to try to address this question as to what is hypersonic flow? Hypersonic aerodynamics, what is it? Well. First thing is, we're dealing with thin shock layers. Let's see what we're talking about there. This is a schematic of a 15 degree wedge in a Mach 36 flow. The shock wave is at an 18 degree angle. Look at the flow between the shock and the body. It's called the shock layer. What do you see? The shock wave lies very close to the body. The shock layer between the shock and the body is extremely thin. Thin shock layers, that's a characteristic of hypersonic flow. And as a matter of fact, if you look at the streamlines in this picture, here are the streamlines coming in and the free stream, nice, straight, and parallel. They are uniformly deflected across the shock wave, and then we have straight, parallel streamlines along the surface. But they're all bunched up in the, between the shock and the body. And in fact, if you would uh, look at this, if you would view this picture that you see on the screen from about one block away, this hypersonic flow would look almost as if the flow is coming in and literally impinging on the surface and then running along tangentially to the surface. This kind of a picture that you see this, that's characterized by thin shock layers, hypersonic flow is characterized by thin shock layers. Second point, the generation of something called an entropy layer. What's an entropy layer? Visualize on that wedge that we were looking at a moment ago, a blunt nose now. And we have a strong curved bow shock wave in front of that nose. Streamline that comes through the strong portion of the shock wave encounters uh, a large entropy increase. A streamline that comes through a weaker portion of the shock wave encounters a smaller entropy increase. Result, there's a region here in the nose region where there, the flow field has extremely large gradients in entropy. This region where the large gradients of entropy exist flows downstream and wets the surface of the body. The boundary layer along the surface of the body grows within that entropy layer. And this causes physical and theoretical problems, interactions, so to speak, between the outer inviscid flow and the boundary layer itself that have to be taken into account. And this is a major characteristic of hypersonic flow. Viscous interactions. This is another physical phenomenon that's characteristic of hypersonic flow. What are we talking about here? Here's a sketch of a typical qualitative temperature distribution, temperature, as a function of distance through the boundary layer, starting at the wall, going up through the boundary layer. In a high-speed boundary layer, the temperature variation looks like this. Temperature increases, usually reaches a peak, and then comes back down to the wall temperature. By the way, question. Why does the temperature go up so much in the boundary layer? Why is, in fact, why, you know, why, why do we see something like this? Why do you get such a large temperature increase in the boundary layer? Anybody tell me? Friction. Friction, friction sure, friction, that's what's happening in the boundary layer. You know, if you rub your two hands together, you generate a lot of heat, don't you? And what's happening there at these very high speeds, the influence of friction, the effect of friction, is basically dissipating the high kinetic energy of the flow. You know, the flow comes in here at the outer edge of the boundary layer with lots of kinetic energy. It might be at Mach 25. By the time the flow gets buried deep inside the boundary layer, it might be down at Mach 0.05. That means there's a heck of a lot of kinetic energy that's been dissipated. And where has that kinetic energy gone? 
that kinetic energy has gone in part into the internal energy of the gas, and that is reflected as a temperature increase in the boundary layer. Now, next question. If the temperature within that boundary layer goes way up, what do you think is happening to the density in the boundary layer? It's going way down, because you may recall that for all practical purposes, the pressure is constant through the boundary layer. So if the temperature goes up, the density's got to go way down. And if the density goes way down, what do you think is going to happen to the thickness of this boundary layer? The boundary layer has to process a certain amount of mass flow. And if the density inside that boundary layer is low, the thickness of the boundary layer has got to be larger, got to become large. And so the net effect is at hypersonic speeds, you encounter thick boundary layers. These thick boundary layers change the aerodynamics of the flow over your body. I uh, just show an example here, and we'll be talking a lot more about these things later on. But this is a plot, actually, these are, this is a plot of experimental measurements for the pressure distribution as a function of distance along a sharp cone. This is at Mach 11. And if we had no viscous flow, if we had no boundary layer along the surface of the cone, then the cone pressure divided by P sub C, which is the inviscid pressure that would, would exist on the cone if we had no boundary layer, that's a horizontal line, but when you make your measurements in the wind tunnel, you find that the pressures are much higher than the inviscid calculations indicate. Why? Because in reality, there is a very thick boundary layer growing along the surface of the cone, and as far as the flow is concerned, the body looks different than a cone. Body that doesn't look like a cone anymore, and we are in essence getting an induced pressure effect, which is a characteristic of this viscous interaction. Very important kind of characteristic. High temperature flows, another physical characteristic of hypersonic flow. The, let's take a quick look at that. The, uh, here we have a Mach 36 flow coming in to a blunt nose body, strong bow shock wave detached in front of the body. At Mach 36, all this kinetic energy is slowed down, is, is, is basically dissipated. Flow velocity goes way down across the shock wave. Net effect, we get large temperatures behind the shock. How large? On the order of 11,000 degrees Kelvin. This is like an Apollo. When the Apollo entry lunar return module came back and entered the atmosphere, Mach 36, in that shock layer in this region, temperatures reached about 11,000 degrees Kelvin. Uh, can anybody here tell me what the surface temperature of the sun is? Surface temperature of the sun. Anybody have any idea? 10,000. 10, mm, not quite. A little bit le uh, less than that. On the order of about 6,000 degrees Kelvin, surface temperature of the sun. What we're talking about here, under these conditions, is a temperature in the shock layer that is almost twice the surface temperature of the sun. So you can readily imagine what that's doing to your flow field. You can readily imagine what that's doing to your heat transfer to the vehicle, for example. So high temperature effects, they're very important. And in fact, let, let's take a little, a little additional look at this. From time to time throughout this course, we'll be looking at something called velocity altitude maps. This is a plot of a uh, vehicle velocity function of altitude. And imagine an entry vehicle coming in here at high velocities, maybe uh, one coming in from basically from orbit at around 26,000 feet per second. So we're way up there at high altitude at 26,000 feet per second. As the vehicle penetrates the atmosphere, it begins to slow down. And so its flight path on this velocity altitude map looks something like this. This is a typical flight path for a lifting entry vehicle. Now, superimposed on top of this uh, diagram, this velocity altitude map, are ranges where certain physical chemistry effects happen due to the high temperatures. For example, if we start down here at the low velocity and, and visualize that we're increasing velocity as we go out here towards the right, the first thing that is encountered from, that's a deviation from our normal experience with room temperature air, is that the vibrational energy in the gas begins to become excited. We'll talk about this later today. The, then as we fly faster, the oxygen begins to dissociate. And then as we fly faster yet, the nitrogen begins to dissociate. And if we fly fast enough, we'll get ionization. As, in, as was encountered with the Apollo entry. These are all real things. And notice, almost the virtually the vast majority of the flight path of these entry vehicles are immersed in regions of the velocity altitude map where high temperature effects are going on. 
So this is an important aspect of hypersonic flow, and we'll talk more about this. So think of this for a minute while you're looking at this picture. Think of this. What is the definition of hypersonic flow? Hypersonic flow is that portion of the more or less extreme high Mach number spectrum where certain physical phenomena become important that weren't so important at lower supersonic speeds. What physical phenomena? The ones we were just looking at. Thin shock layers, entropy layers, the viscous interaction phenomena, high temperature effects. These are the physical phenomena that distinguish hypersonic flow from supersonic flow, and that is what is basically the definition of hypersonic flow. So the next time that somebody asks you to define hypersonic flow, tell them that you'll be back in 30 minutes, and you go off somewhere, and you write a theme, a three-page theme, and you tell them what hypersonic aerodynamics is. Now, all of these physical effects are effects that we're going to be addressing today and tomorrow in this short course. Now, final words. We, we looked at the X-1 and we looked at the F-104 for supersonic airplanes. We said hypersonic vehicles are going to look, clearly do look different from, uh, from those supersonic vehicles. And today, we're, the kind of material that we're talking about in this course, and by the time you walk out tomorrow afternoon at 5 o'clock, you will have a better feel to a feeling and understanding of why it is that new modern hypersonic vehicles may look like this for hypersonic transport. Of course, this is an old Aviation Week photograph. I don't know if we'll ever see something shaped like this, but it's a kind of a neat idea. Or is it going to look like this? We don't know. But there is going to be a future, there are going to be future generations of hypersonic vehicles. And I suspect that the reason that all of us are here today and all of us are, are, are interested in, in these discussions today and tomorrow or will ultimately, for the purpose of ultimately giving us a better handle of understanding and coming up with shapes, design characteristics of future hypersonic vehicles. So that's all with the slides. And John, if you could turn the lights back on, please. In about a minute or two minutes, I'd ask you to turn that off for me, would you please? Okay. So much for the introduction. Let's take a look at what we're going to do with the rest of, to, of today. Uh, and as a matter of fact, uh, mechanically speaking, for those of you here in the room, for the rest of today, I'm going to be sh utilizing visual aids that will utilize an overhead camera, which you can see here in the room. Uh, for those of you who are on the outside, you will see these visual aids show up on your monitor. Uh, the visual aids come from one of the, sor one of the material sources for this course. The, as Nelson Friedman had mentioned earlier, and I'll point it out again, for our discussion today, I'm going to be using <clears throat> material obtained from this book, which I hope that all of you have, because we're going to be touching on direct material from this book, and I'd like for you to have the opportunity to relate it to other things that you see and, and read in the book. And uh, the what we're going to find is this. We have a little less than five hours left today to talk about the basic fundamentals of hypersonic aerodynamics. Here at the University of Maryland, we have a whole semester course to talk about these things. Uh, so obviously, we're not going to be able to go into a great deal of detail. What I want to achieve for you here is the following. I want to give you a basic, almost 95% almost qualitative discussion of the fundamental basic ideas <coughs> excuse me, of hypersonic aerodynamics. Uh, we will in essence, kind of be dancing across the tops of the clouds in hypersonic flow. But my purpose here is to give you some reasonable physical feel for what's going on, because all the quantitative aspects that you need to know, you can look up in the material, in the book, uh, which we again will be referring back to as a, as a reference source. So, I said again, we're going to be telling a story by more or less going through a number of uh, uh, of general physical concepts, and we will be following along material directly from the textbook. So I'm going to start. I'm going to start by <clears throat> by showing you and, and and talking about 
a general mo roadmap for our discussion today. Uh, you can find this on page 27, and what you see here is a general roadmap representing hypersonic aerodynamics, which is split into three categories. One, inviscid flow, another, viscous flow, and a third one, high temperature flows. We're going to follow this roadmap as carefully as possible today, and we're going to start out by concentrating, first of all, on inviscid flow. Now, we're going to jump right into this. By the way, I should mention that if any of you have any questions, feel free, I mean, whether we're on television or not, feel free to raise your hand and jump up and down and ask questions because uh, uh, that's a lot of times, that's where all the action is anyway. Okay, we're going to go back, we're going to start out talking about inviscid flows. What's an inviscid flow? An inviscid flow is a flow in which there are no dissipative phenomena, no transport phenomena acting on the flow. No friction, no thermal conduction, no diffusion. That's what an inviscid flow is. And the first item that we're going to talk about just for a few moments are basic hypersonic shock and expansion relations. So let's do that. Yeah, to calibrate in your book, what we're going to be talking about begins on page 29, part one, inviscid hypersonic flow. For the next few moments, we'll be mentioning hypersonic shock and expansion waves. Principally, just we're looking at the hypersonic shock relations. Okay? Now, let's concentrate for a moment on figure 2-2, which you can find in your book on page 34. We're looking at an oblique shock wave. We're looking at flow through this uh, oblique shock wave. And most of you probably recognize from past experience that there are relationships for the changes in pressure and temperature and density and velocity and Mach number across a shock wave that you can readily obtain from the shock wave theory from supersonic aerodynamics. If you make the assumption that the Mach number becomes very large in these situations, the Mach number becomes very large uh, in front of a shock wave, then these shock wave relations reduce to some simple forms, which we can see here in the corner, and I'll, it's called in the hypersonic limit. We have simple equations for the pressure, density, temperature ratios, velocities, and by the way, I might point out to you that in this diagram there's a little bit difference than what many of you may be f used to seeing. Frequently in shock wave relations, we resolve the velocity in front of and behind the shock into components tangential and perpendicular to the shock. In this picture, notice that we're talking about a component that is in the free stream direction behind the shock and a component that's perpendicular to the free stream behind the shock. And if you wish, you can derive shock relationships for the velocity u2 and v2 uh, representing horizontal and vertical components. There's a specific reason for doing it this way, which I'll address a little bit later on. But in any event, I simply want you to know that if we just look at a simple fluid dynamic problem, an aerodynamic problem involved, that is, changes across a shock wave. In the limit as the Mach number becomes very high, these are expressions for the changes across the shock wave. And also I want to point out, see what happens here, the pressure ratio, when we go to high Mach numbers, the pressure goes to infinity. If the Mach number goes to infinity, the pressure goes to infinity. On the other hand, the density behind the shock, as the Mach number goes to infinity, the density behind the shock approaches a limiting value. That's important to keep in mind. As the Mach number goes to infinity, the temperature goes to infinity, theoretically. But as the Mach number goes to infinity, this velocity, u2 divided by v1, u2 divided by v1, that approaches a limiting value, this, namely this expression right here. And so does v2 or v1 approaches a limiting value. Then finally, the pressure coefficient also approaches a limiting value, namely this right here. Now, before we go any further, before we go any further, if someone's asking the question, what is a pressure coefficient? Let me write down definition of pressure coefficient. Pressure coefficient, and we'll wait for this to come up on the overhead. The pressure coefficient, by definition, is pressure at any point in the flow field divided by the free stream pressure over the free stream dynamic pressure. That's the definition of the pressure coefficient. We'll be referring to pressure coefficients fairly frequently throughout our discussion, and so we wanted to make sure everybody knew what we were talking about. And finally, in the hypersonic limit, it's rather interesting, the wave angle beta approaches a limiting value that's just a function of the deflection angle theta across the wave, gamma plus 1 over 2. If gamma is 1.4, then uh, this ratio, 
uh, essentially says that beta is, because, is about a 20% larger angle than theta. It's kind of interesting thing. Okay, that's hypersonic shock relations. Just wanted to point out to you that there are these things, and we're going to refer back to these relationships every once in a while. Okay, now, let's go back to our roadmap. That's all that we're going to talk about in terms of the shock relations, that there are some specialized forms that you can obtain in hypersonic flow. Our next item of business is this. While we're talking about inviscid flows, let's go immediately to an approach to some, some discussion here that is almost a design-oriented aspect of hypersonic aerodynamics. And that is using approximate methods for calculating the pressure distribution along the surface of hypersonic vehicles. So approximate in, this, in, in, in the way that they depend only on the local angle that the surface makes with regard to the free stream direction. These are called local surface inclination methods. There are four of them listed here, Newtonian, tangent wedge, tangent cone, shock expansion. Let's take a look at what is meant by these local surface inclination methods. Okay. That is the subject of chapter three in your notes, beginning on page 45. And uh, so this is what we're going to be talking about. Let's go immediately to page 47. I want to point out to you figure 3.1. Figure 3.1, we see a sketch of a surface inclined in a flow. This is like a flat plate, inclined at an angle theta to an incoming flow. Now, going back into history, in 1687, in his Principia, Isaac Newton had several models of a fluid flow. One of those models was this. He visualized a stream of particles coming in, just rectilinear, straight line motion, like BBs coming in, literally impacting the surface, and then running tangentially parallel to the surface. As these particles impact the surface, they give up their normal component of momentum which then in turn result the time rate of change of that normal component of momentum results in a force perpendicular to the plate. That force is essentially a pressure. And all, there is a discussion, a derivation, which I won't go through, that leads to an expression for the pressure coefficient that you can find on the next page, equation 3.3, for the pressure coefficient based on what is called the Newtonian model. This is called the Newtonian sine squared law. It was first obtained at the end of the, sixth, uh, end of the 17th century. It was used to calculate pressure coefficients in all kinds of applications during the 18th and 19th centuries. Pressures on ship hulls, forces on airplane wings, and the results were terrible. And everybody knew the results were terrible, and everybody still kept using this equation. Why? Because it's the simplest possible equation you can imagine. I, can't, I defy you to find a simpler expression for the pressure coefficient than 2 sine squared theta. But why are we talking about it today? The reason that we're talking about it today is this. If we look at figure 3.2 here, remember this is, this is a repeat of what we were looking at on the slide a few moments ago. What we have here is a Mach 36 flow, a 15 degree wedge. The shock wave here is at 18 degrees. The shock layer is very thin. And again, if you look at this figure, if you stand back about a block away and look at this figure, what you see is a stream of, of air coming in, and it looks like that air is literally impinging on the surface and then running tangentially to the surface. This picture looks like Isaac Newton's model. So here we have in 1991, or we'll even say in the late 20th century, Newtonian theory alive and well the first time that it could properly be applied to an aerodynamic problem, namely that of hypersonic flight. And of course, Isaac Newton never even thought about this. At least there's no written indication that he ever thought about this. But in any event, this sine squared law equation 3.3, we'll put that back on the overhead. This is called the Newtonian sine squared law, and it is a very useful expression for the prediction of pressures on the surface of surfaces of hypersonic vehicles. Now, let's look at an application of this very quickly. On page 50, let's look at figure 34, 3.4 that is. 
The picture that the way that we visualize the use of Newtonian theory is that we have flow coming in, impacting on the surface, and therefore the flow can only impact on those portions of the surface that are forcing, facing forward. Those portions of the surface that are facing backward don't have any impact, and we have to say then the pressure coefficient is zero on that. This is called the shadow of the body. Now let's apply this picture to a flat plate, flow over a flat plate for a minute. Here we have a flat plate at an angle of attack alpha, incoming flow velocity v infinity. The pressure coefficient on the bottom surface is 2 sine squared alpha. The pressure coefficient on the top surface is 0. This gives rise to a normal force, which can be resolved into lift and drag on the plate. When we use the Newtonian law to calculate the lift and drag coefficients. We'll go down here to the lift and drag coefficients. Here's the lift coefficient for that flat plate, 2 sine squared alpha cosine alpha. When we use the Newtonian law to calculate the drag coefficient, you get 2 sine cubed alpha. Again, all the derivation is, in the, is above that, which you can look at when you have plenty of time tonight and have nothing else to do at midnight. You can look at the derivation for that. And the lift over drag ratio is nothing other than the cotangent of the angle of attack. Well, these are kind of interesting results, uh, but you can say, so what? Let's take a look at the plot of these results on graphs. That's figure 3-6. Figure 3-6, first of all, let's look at the lift coefficient. This is a plot of the lift coefficient versus angle of attack for this flat plate based on Newtonian theory. And what do we see? We see the lift coefficient increasing, reaching a maximum, and then decreasing down to zero. Now, why does the lift coefficient reach a maximum and then decrease down to zero? Anybody have any thoughts on that? Has nothing to do with flow field separa separation, by the way, because we're not dealing with that here. It's a geometry effect, of course. The fact is, is that the normal, uh, if, if, we, if we look at me for a minute, here's the flat plate. As the ang and the, the force is normal to that flat plate, as we increase the angle of attack, the pressure on the bottom is going up. That's increasing the magnitude of the normal force. But that normal force is rotating backwards more and more. And you're going to, although the magnitude of the normal force increases, it's component in the lift direction. It's sooner or later, got to go to zero. It's 90 degrees. The normal force is that way. What's the lift? The lift is zero. So it's a geometry effect. The reason that the lift coefficient goes through a maximum is basically a geometry effect. That curves right around 55 degrees kind of interesting. If you look at the variation of lift coefficient for typical hypersonic vehicles, especially those with kind of like flat bottoms, you will find that the lift coefficient does tend to peak out at this high angle of attack somewhere around 55 degrees. There's another characteristic that I want to point out to you. Look at this. Down here at the small angles of attack, we see that as the angle of attack alpha increases, the lift coefficient increases, and it increases in a nonlinear fashion. Now, question for you. For those of you who are aeronautical engineers or have had some basic low-speed aerodynamics, question. What's the lift slope of a standard airfoil? If we had a standard airfoil like on a Cessna 150 or a standard uh, NACA 2412 airfoil, and you measure the lift coefficient versus angle of attack, and you get this uh, curve. What is that curve going to look like? It's going to be a straight line, exactly. If there's going to, the lift coefficient is going to have a linear variation with angle of attack. As a matter of fact, you may remember from potential flow theory that the theoretical slope of the lift coefficient is 2 pi per radian. Linear variation. Same thing in supersonic flow. If you take that F-104 and you pitch it through an angle of attack, and you look at the wing lift coefficient, and you will see a linear variation of lift coefficient with angle of attack. But what do we see here? We see a nonlinear variation. And this is a hint of something that dominates all of hypersonic flow theory. Hypersonic flow theory is inherently nonlinear theory. Everything we do in hypersonics is inherently nonlinear. So please keep that in mind, and this is a hint of that happening. Finally, we see the lift over drag ratio. Uh, the lift over drag ratio increases as we decrease the angle of attack, and it shows L over D going to infinity at zero degrees. Is that going to happen? 
We're going to design, uh, should, our, should our national airspace plane be a flat plate flying at zero degrees? We'd have an infinite lift or drag ratio according to this. But what's wrong with that? What's wrong with this? Pardon? You've got zero over zero. Ex well, ex exactly, you've got zero over zero. <laughs> this is quite true. And in real life, what do you have? In real life, at zero degrees angle attack, you have zero lift, but you have a finite drag. And obviously, the viscous effects will take over. And what will happen if we draw in viscous effects here, what we would see is that at some angle of attack, usually about four or five degrees, it depends on what the zero lift drag coefficient is, it will peak out and it will zonk down here to very rapidly to zero because of the viscous effects. But nevertheless, this uh, Newtonian flow gives us some interesting results having to do with uh, what you might begin to expect in terms of aerodynamic characteristics of hypersonic flows. Okay, so that is the story, more or less, uh, and there is more to the story, but we're not going to take time to go into it, having to do, and we're going to go back to our roadmap here for a minute, having to do with Newtonian flow, Newtonian flow as a local surface inclination method. Let's go on to some others. Let's check out, for example, the tangent wedge. What is meant by a tangent wedge? Okay, well. What we have is this. This is another approach to estimate the pressure on the surface of a hypersonic vehicle. Another approach. <clears throat> Let's look at a body. Now, this can be basically a two-dimensional body. Let's say that uh, we want to predict the pressure at point I on this body. Well, let's simply draw a line tangent to the surface at point I that makes an angle theta sub I with uh, respect to the free stream. Now imagine that this tangent line is essentially the surface of an effective wedge that has an angle theta. Then you calculate on that effective wedge shock wave angle, that's the effective wedge shock, and the pressure at point I is there and then assumed to be the pressure on the surface of that wedge at the given free stream Mach number with the angle theta sub i. And that's all there is to it. That is what is meant by the tangent wedge method. There is no theoretical justification for it. There is no derivation for this. It's one of those intuitive theories that people try. And believe it or not, it actually gives some reasonable results. And before I show you those, let me point out to you a corollary to this, figure 316 the tangent cone approach, which is in the same category. Here, where you can visualize you might have an axisymmetric body. There's point I on the surface of the axisymmetric body. You draw in a line tangent to point I. It makes an angle theta sub I with respect to the uh, local, uh, the, the horizontal, or the free stream direction. <clears throat> and then we visualize that, that tangent line as the surface of an effective cone with a cone angle theta sub I. And then we calculate the pressure on the surface of that cone using standard conical flow theory, Taylor-McCall solution. And then we say the pressure at this point I on this axisymmetric body is then the same as the pressure on the cone. Same lack of theoretical underpinning. There's no theoretical justification for this for all practical purposes. It's just an intuitive thought. Let's take a look at some uh, results. In figure 318, you can see a comparison for the pressure distribution as a function of distance x along, this, along an ogive, where the solid line represents a calculation from the method of characteristics, and we'll talk about this briefly later on, but the method of characteristics is an exact numerical solution for the supersonic and hypersonic flow over this body. So visualize the solid line as an exact result. The dashed line here is the result assuming the tangent cone approach. And what we have here, pressure distribution is a function of distance for basically different Mach numbers. Uh, what, what is really tabulated here is Mach number times the diameter t uh, divided by the length of the vehicle. At this stage, I'm going to introduce a definition that we're going to refer to later on. This ratio right here, D over L, we're going to call the, the slenderness ratio of the body, and I'm going to symbolize that by symbol tau later on. And it's multiplied by Mach number, and later on we're going to call this Mach number times tau a hypersonic similarity parameter, but we haven't said anything about that yet. 
But in any event, what is plotted here, visualize for a given ogive, a given, with a given d over l, that these curves all correspond to different Mach numbers. And we can see that the tangent cone method agrees reasonably well, particularly at the higher Mach numbers, with the exact results. So the tangent cone method is not so bad. Let's go back to our roadmap for a minute. Under these local surface inclination methods, again looking at page 27, Shock expansion, we have one item left, shock expansion. Let's take a quick look at that. What is meant by the shock expansion? We're looking here at figure 319. Here we have a body. Could be a two-dimensional body or an axisymmetric body, what have you. Let's go to the nose. The nose angle is theta sub n. There is a shock wave right at the nose, attached shock wave at the tip. If this is a two-dimensional body, we can assume that the very tip of that body is a wedge with an angle theta sub n. And we can exactly calculate the shock wave properties across the shock wave for that wedge of angle theta sub n for a given free stream Mach number, as we show here, so that we can get a Mach number associated with the flow in the vicinity of the nose and a pressure as well. And then we simply take, allow the flow to expand around the surface of the body, assuming a local Prandtl-Meyer expansion. This is called the shock expansion method. And the pressure at point I is therefore the pressure that would exist along the surface, starting with the pressure behind the shock wave on the wedge nose and expanding through a deflection angle, theta sub I minus, uh, theta sub N minus theta sub I through a Prandtl-Meyer expansion. And this will give us a pressure at point I. That is called the shock expansion method. Now, let's take a look at some results. Figure 321 on page 73. This is a plot of pressure coefficient as a function of distance over an ogive, similar to the one we were looking at a moment ago. Pressure coefficient as a function of distance. The S open circles here represent experimental data. The solid line is the method of characteristics and exact solution. So you can see, as a matter of fact, method characteristics agrees very well with the experimental data. The shock expansion method is given by the dash curve here. Now, the Mach number for this picture that we're looking at is Mach 2.73. That's not a hypersonic Mach number. And we see that there's not particularly good agreement between the shock expansion and the method of characteristics. But if we go to a higher Mach number, like 5.05, .05, getting over into the hypersonic regime, we can see that there's better agreement between the shock expansion, which is a very simple approximate engineering method, and both the experimental data and the method of characteristics, which is an exact method. So the shock expansion method is a reasonable technique for calculating pressure distributions in an approximate fashion over hypersonic bodies. But not so much so at supersonic speeds. And the reason why the shock expansion method works better for hypersonics than for supersonics, we can see down here in figure 322. First, let's look at a supersonic flow. In a supersonic flow over a body shape like this, supersonic Mach numbers, we have shock waves that are fairly high angle. That means the Mach waves that come up from the body reflect all, and that are reflected off of the shock wave come back down and intersect the surface of the body. And there are a lot of these reflected waves that uh, impact, uh, that actually touch the surface of the body. The shock expansion method does not account for these reflected waves, which are given by the dashed lines. And so that's the weakness in the shock expansion method. Now, if we look at the hypersonic picture in contrast, the shock wave is a much lower angle. Remember we said earlier in our slide presentation, hypersonic speeds, speeds the shock wave lies close to the body. And the reflected Mach waves themselves are at much smaller angles. And the Mach waves themselves are at much smaller angles. And the reflected waves are impacting the body or touching the body further downstream. So you can just kind of look at these two pictures and look at and, and kind of ascertain, well, in this picture, the thing we're ignoring, namely the reflected waves, they're not so important in this picture. And that is why the shock expansion method works better at hypersonic speeds than supersonic speeds. So in just a few short minutes there, what we've taken a look at is this. We'll go back to our roadmap for a minute.
we've taken a look at, very quickly, approaches for making approximate estimates of the pressure distribution on the surface of hypersonic bodies using four different techniques, the Newtonian approach, tangent wedge, tangent cone, shock expansion. I might mention, and some of you probably already recognize, that all four of these techniques are used for engineering uh, estimates of pressure distributions and therefore lift and wave drag on hypersonic vehicles. There is a standard computer program that's in standard use today by both industry and government <coughs> called the Gentry Program, the Hypersonic Arbitrary Body Program, in which all four of these approximate pressure distribution, this, these local surface inclination approaches, all four of these are options in that program. So for those of you who use that program and use various options, this is what's going on. This is what you're doing when you use those options. Now, where do we go from here? Back to looking at our, our roadmap, dealing with inviscid flows. We now, after talking about these shock relations and the local surface inclination method, let's now go on over here and start talking about more detailed flow field considerations. Question, Question. yes. <laughs> I knew somebody was going to ask that. There is no answer to that. Uh, there is no answer to that. However, you can use some common sense. If you're interested in calculating, say, a pressure distribution over a fuselage-type fuselage shape or something that looks like an axisymmetric body, the tangent cone approach, and we'll use the overhead camera here again, the tangent cone approach or the shock expansion might be pretty good for that. If you're trying to calculate the pressure distribution over a wing-like surface, the tangent wedge might be pretty good for that. If you're interested in calculating the flow, uh, you, uh, say, over a blunt nose body, then the Newtonian flow might be good for that. And let me show you why. We're going to backtrack here for a minute, see if I can't find something. I'm going to backtrack back to figure 3.8 on page 55. We didn't look at this originally, but we're going to look at it now. This is a plot of the pressure distribution as a function of, say, distance along the surface of a blunt nose body. It actually is a function of distance y perpendicular to the flow, but visualize this as a pressure distribution along the surface of the body. The solid circles there represent, and we'll simply say the solid line, represents an exact numerical solution for the pressure distribution over this blunt nose body. Exact pressure distribution. The Newtonian law, the two sine squared theta that we were dealing with, gives us this dashed line here. A slightly modified Newtonian result, which I didn't show you, but which I'll show you now, Instead of having a 2 here, we put in a maximum pressure coefficient right at the stagnation point and multiply that by sine squared theta. It's called modified Newtonian. That gives us these circles, and that gives you very good agreement. So if you're interested in calculating pressure distributions and forces on blunt noses, use Newtonian flow. It's a, good re it's a good result. And then finally, to the final part of your question, we have about a minute left here, is let's take a look at figure 314. This is a plot of pressure coefficient as a function of Mach number for flows over a 15 degree, first of all, wedge, and also a 15 degree cone. And what are we looking at here? First of all, let's look at this solid line. This is an exact solution for the flow, exact oblique shock solution for the flow over a wedge. That's the exact result. This curve is an exact solution for the flow over a cone using Taylor McCall. The dashed line is the Newtonian result, 2 sine squared theta. You can see that at fairly high Mach numbers, the Newtonian result agrees pretty well, especially with the cone, not quite so well with the wedge result, but pretty well with the cone result. This gives you an idea of how accurate Newtonian theory is for slender bodies. Not so bad, not so good, but not so bad out here at high enough Mach numbers. I wouldn't recommend the use of Newtonian flow for very slender bodies. Use tangent wedge, tangent cone. But Newtonian flow is great 
for blunt nose bodies, for the blunt nose parts of those bodies. So that's kind of a way. The, the answer again to your question is there's no real answer to it. You have to use just some judgment and some intuition. And with that, I'm afraid we have to call it quits for the time being. For those of you who are here, I think we have a 30-minute break for lunch, according to my schedule. Uh, for those of you out on the West Coast, you can go get an extended cup of coffee somewhere. So with that, we'll call it quits.